This is the Pixar Theory. The Pixar Theory. The Pixar Theory. Pixar Multiverse Theory. The Pixar Theory. The Pixar Theory. The Pixar Theory. Pixar Theory. Pixar Theory. By far, the most popular fan theory of all time in any media is the Pixar Theory. The idea that every Pixar movie exists in the same cinematic universe, and all the hidden Easter eggs referencing other Pixar movies are actually carefully crafted hints that can be used to explain how all of these very different movies exist in one universe. It was created by John Negroni and has since been restated and added on to by hundreds of different people across the internet. And for good reason. I think the Pixar Theory is such a fun and and clever way to think about these movies, and the amount of connections they were able to find is really impressive. But I also think the Pixar theory is fundamentally flawed. The theory heavily relies on the logic behind Easter eggs in Pixar movies to construct its narrative. I'm not really gonna explain the theory in this video, but stuff like the reoccurring by and large logo being proof of machines taking over, or the fact that the witch from Brave somehow has a Sully carving being proof that she's actually Boo from the future. I'm not saying you can't use Easter eggs in a fan theory, I use them all the time. They are very useful in theory crafting. But if you're gonna claim this Easter egg as evidence in your theory, then how do you explain Boo having a Nemo toy in Monsters, Inc., or all of these Bugs Life toys in Toy Story 2, or all of the other many, many, many references to other Pixar movies. You can't just say, oh, th those are just fun Easter eggs referencing other movies, they don't count. If you're also saying, this Easter egg, now, now this one is actually proof of time travel and these movies being connected. Either they're all intricately placed hints about the lore, or they're all just references that don't matter. You can't have it both ways. And if we're being honest, 99% of Pixar Easter eggs are just references that can't be explained by any in-universe reason. And look, I'm not trying to ruin anyone's fun here. I know most people already know this and still choose to enjoy the Pixar theory just because it's a fun way to think about these movies, even if there isn't actually any hard evidence. That's at least how I enjoy it. But. What if I told you there was another way to connect these movies? A way that doesn't just rely on tiny background easter eggs, an alternative way to look at this theory, based on actual, concrete, indisputable evidence of these characters existing in the same universe. Evidence that I have never seen even mentioned in another Pixar theory. That must sound too good to be true, right? There have been hundreds of different theories trying to connect these movies over the years. How could there possibly be anything else to say? Well. What if I told you we've all been looking in the wrong place? This is Alex Bale's Pixar Metaverse Theory. I'm calling it Alex Bale's Theory, by the way, so that if all these other Pixar Theory channels start covering it, they, they gotta give me credit, okay? This is my theory. You want to eat the best, but cooking is a mess. Frozen store-bought meals seem easy, but the results will make you queasy. Not anymore. Introducing Factor Meals, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service. Factor's delicious chef-prepared meals take the guesswork out of eating well, so you can eat healthy without the hassle. And that's not all. There's no prep work, no mess. Factor Meals arrive prepared and ready to eat in just two minutes or less. That's right, just two minutes minutes or less. But we're not done yet. Factor offers over 34 nutritional meal options and over 36 add-ons like smoothies, keto shakes, desserts, and more. I love Factor meals because they taste so good and they're super convenient for my on-the-go lifestyle. That's right, it's me, Alex Vale. I've been speaking this whole time. This is what I sound like now. I just started talking like this and now I can't stop. Please help me. And that's not all. If you use the link in the description or scan the QR code, you can get 50% off your first Factor Box. That's right, 50% off your first Factor Box. And if you're still not convinced, we'll throw in free wellness shots for life. That's two free wellness shots from the three available flavors in every order. But this incredible offer won't last. So use the link in the description or scan the QR code with your phone now. Offer only valid for new customers with qualifying auto -renew Doing subscription purchases. See factor75.com forward slash terms for details. Please help me. I'm trapped inside of an infomercial. I'm in horrible pain and all I see is darkness. Hey, before we start the video, I just want to say I'm back to making theories. This is not a part of the Don't Feed the Muse ARG. That series is over and I am done making SpongeBob theories, but I do have one last special thing planned for you SpongeBob theory fans. I'll talk about that a little more at the end. Let's finally begin the Pixar Metaverse theory.
When Pixar was first starting out, they used to include these little bonus segments during the end credits of their movies. Speed. Marker. And action. Are you saying I'm stupid? <laughs> Marker. Woo! <laughs> Should that just be part of the movie now? These were bloopers where they would reshow scenes from the movie, but the characters would suddenly forget their lines or mess up and break character. Go get him, Mr. Solomon! You idiot! It's Solomon, not Solomon! What? You're messing up the scene! Sorry! We're never gonna work in Hollywood again! <laughs> Does this mean we can break for lunch? <laughs> what? What's so funny? Woody! It's something you'd expect from a live-action movie with real actors, but these are obviously animated movies with fake computer-generated characters and environments, meaning the creators went out of their way to make these fake bloopers just to make the movies feel more real. They even sometimes show the crew filming them. Now obviously, these are not canon. They're just funny gags where we get to pretend like the characters are real actors on a real set. It's something that other animated movies have also done. 1527 take one. Roar! That's the closest I can get right now. I'm on a seafood diet. I eat, I see seafood? Never mind. <laughs> ah. But if that's the case, if this is just a random throwaway gag for the credits and not something we should actually think about, then why did the creators go out of their way to make the crew filming a Bugs Life also bugs? Actually, it wasn't even my idea. Hey, what's it like? It's a weird detail to include for such a quick little nothing gag, right? But this detail has some very interesting implications for this weird little meta alternate universe where all the characters are just actors who know they're filming a movie. Like, this has to mean that in this universe, these actors are actually real talking bugs, right? Like, I first assumed maybe the implication was that they were just like humans in bug costumes, but there's no way the crew would also be in costumes too. So this means that they must all be real talking bugs. We are looking at a universe where talking bugs are making movies about talking bugs with tiny cameras and tiny film equipment, and they're not alone. The Monsters Inc. bloopers also feature monsters on the crew filming the movie. And while we don't fully see the crew in the Toy Story bloopers, and they seem to have human hands, they're the same size as the toys, and in one shot, if you look closely, we can see enough of the arm to reveal it as the exact same weird bendy elbow that Woody does, meaning they are all actually toys. All of these fictional in-universe movies are being filmed by the actual talking sentient creatures from their respective movies, meaning talking bugs, toys, and monsters all actually exist in these weird meta blooper universes. Okay, that's that's pretty interesting, but why does any of this really matter? At the end of the day, these are still just little bonus segments that exist in their own separate continuities. It's not actually canon to the real Pixar universe that we care about. And that's true, but unlike the Pixar universe, these bloopers actually feature, for the very first time ever, concrete connections between these films. <laughs> You know, I can't believe you talked him into me. Hey, man! Hey, how was that? Woody shows up as a crew member on A Bug's Life. The bugs show up in Toy Story 2, and Rex shows up in the Monsters, Inc. bloopers. And these are not just little background references. These are indisputable crossovers where the characters interact with each other. So no, this is not a theory about how the story in the Pixar movies connect. This is a theory about how the Pixar metaverse, the fictional universe where all of these stories are just movies filmed by live action actors, connects together. And believe me, there is so much more here than you would ever realize. Before we continue, I just want to say that this theory does not replace or disprove the Pixar theory or any other theories about these movies. Just because they acknowledge in the lore that these are just fictional movies doesn't mean you can't still theorize about the fictional movie plots. Also, as I'm recording this, I did just find out that another YouTuber, The Theorizer, did kind of briefly mention the bloopers in his video, and his Pixar theories do get pretty meta. But as you're about to see, my theory goes in a very different direction, and as far as I'm aware, no one's ever actually talked about 
about the literal crossovers in these bloopers. But you know what, still, go check out his video, he's got some fun stuff, go ahead and compare it to mine. And check out any Pixar theory I show in this video, I think they're all really cool and definitely worth a watch. Also, now that we're getting meta, we're doing kind of a television theory, I just want to clarify that when I talk about Pixar Studios from now on, I'm referring to the fictional in-universe Pixar Studios that is implied to exist in this metaverse. I am not trying to make any claims about the real-life Disney Pixar Studios, I am strictly theorizing about fictional lore here. Please do not sue me, Mr. Mouse, let's continue. So, from now on, I will be referring to this connected, behind-the-scenes cinematic universe as the Pixar Metaverse, a term I'm blatantly stealing from Quentin Reviews. We now know for a fact that the world of the Pixar Metaverse has actual talking toys, bugs, and monsters that all coexist and make movies together about talking toys, bugs, and monsters. Unfortunately, only these three movies had these bloopers, so we don't really get a ton of information about how this Metaverse world works. It seems like the main difference between the Metaverse and the world of the Pixar movies is that humans are most likely aware of all of these talking creatures' existence. We don't see any humans in these bloopers, but the fact that humans are also acting in these movies seems to imply that they're working together. One of the monsters even says they're working in Hollywood. You're messing up the scene! Sorry! We're never gonna work in Hollywood again! So yeah, humans and talking toys and bugs and monsters all peacefully coexist in this world. And even though we never see it, I think there's a good chance that talking rats and fish and maybe even superheroes all exist in the same world and everyone knows about it and it's not a big deal. There would be some exceptions like the films that depict entirely different worlds, but even if the worlds in those movies are fictional, in this metaverse I don't see why there can't also be talking cars and robots and even straight up magical creatures just walking the street. You know, if magical talking toys exist, I feel like they all could exist in the same world at the same time peacefully coexisting. And that's where I was gonna end the Pixar Metaverse theory. It's not the most complicated, in-depth idea, it kinda just explains itself once you think about it. But hey, I I'm not complaining, you know, easy theory means easy video, I got no problem with that. But then, right when I was about to record this video, I felt a little itch in the back of my head. The same itch you get when you look at bad mocap animation or an unlicensed knockoff of a popular character. The kind of itch that tells you there's something off here. That behind the laughter and the kooky hijinks is something profoundly wrong. So I rewatched the bloopers over and over again. For weeks I couldn't sleep without thinking about these damn bloopers. And then one day I finally realized what it was that was bothering me so much. It was this one single clip from the Bugs Life bloopers. Marker. Oh wait, stop. I think I swallowed a bug. I think I swallowed a bug. Wait a second. How, how if if he's a if he swallowed a bug, but but he's a bug. What? In this same clip, they remind us that these are not just people wearing bug costumes. The crew clearly also looks like bugs. But then how did he swallow a tiny bug? Are, are these things not actually bugs? And if so, what are they? And look at their reaction. I think I swallowed a bug. <laughs> <laughs> They're not horrified like he just consumed an equal member of their society. They're laughing the way you or me would laugh if we swallowed a fly. And it's not like flies are tiny in this world either. They're the same size as the ladybug. It's an extremely weird contradiction. But I soon realized it was far from the only one. Speed marker. Woo! I don't remember eating that. Uh, I can't believe that's this. That's the fifth what pie. Was that guy in? Sorry, everyone. I, I had that bean burrito for lunch. I had that bean burrito for lunch. Toys don't eat. Toys have never eaten in any of these movies. The closest we get is maybe bullseye licking cheese dust off a finger, but that's just tasting. They don't have internal organs. They, they can't actually consume food. This would seem to imply that the actors are not toys. But remember, the off-screen crew also looks like toys. And not to mention, in this clip, there are tons of identical Buzz clones that sound exactly like him, even when they're out of character. Cut. Uh, I can't believe That's this. a fifth pie. What is that guy in? Which implies they are real toys, but toys don't eat. 
And why is Rex so big compared to the monsters? Monsters are supposed to be bigger than humans, and much bigger than toys. And why do the bugs look tiny compared to Buzz, even though Woody was shown to be the exact same size as an ant? And why is this bird a mechanical robot? <laughs> when everyone else is a talking living thing. And wait, 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 wait. If, if they're just supposed to be actors pretending to be fictional characters, why does Buzz call Woody, Woody, out of character? What? What are you laughing about? Huh? <laughs> Real funny, Woody. Like, wouldn't Woody's actor have a different name that Buzz would call them when they aren't acting? What? What's so funny? <laughs> Woody! Huh? Darn it, Woody! None of these bloopers make any goddamn sense. And the fact that they don't make any sense doesn't make any goddamn sense. Because the creators clearly went out of their way to add details to clarify the lore of this metaverse world, while also going out of their way to add details that directly contradict what they've set up. Like, literally, in the same shot, they're contradicting themselves. If they're not bugs, then just make the crew human. Or just don't show the crew! You can't have both! <sighs> okay. So... I think the answer to this is obvious. This is all just bullshit. It's a kid's movie. They were just making random shit up. And I've wasted weeks of my life overthinking this. I, I acted all cocky in the beginning of this video, like, oh, I've discovered this amazing new evidence that no one was smart enough to even consider. But the reason why people don't consider these bloopers is because they don't make any fucking sense. And they only made three of these tiny little segments. We haven't gotten another blooper in 22 years. There is not nearly enough content here for me to make a proper theory. And even what we do have is full of contradictions. This whole video has been pointless and I should just scrap it and work on something else. But then I got that itch again. Believe me, I wanted to scrap this video and work on something else, but I couldn't shake the feeling that there must be something somewhere out there that gives us just another glimpse of this behind the scenes metaverse world. So I kept searching searching and searching and searching everywhere I could think of. The Pixar Wikipedia, the Disney Plus spin-offs and short films. I even watched fucking Mater's Tall Tales, and there was still nothing I could use. But then I realized I was looking in the wrong place. Pixar always re-releases their movies on DVD, and a lot of these DVDs have special features and bonus content like creator interviews, deleted scenes, old promotional material, and most importantly, the blooper segments. If there's more metaverse content out there, I bet you it's on these DVDs. So I bought as many DVDs as I could find and started looking through every single menu item until I found a little something called character interviews. We've arranged to go live via satellite to the stars of Toy Story, Woody and Buzz. Hello, guys. Hello. Hello. The Toy Story, A Bug's Life, Finding Nemo, and The Incredibles DVDs all feature character interviews. Thank you for letting us in on the set. Hi. Hello. This is a set for Andy's room. It's where all us toys live in the movie. Oh, well, you know, we really shouldn't give too much away. These are interviews with the animated characters talking with real live action humans trying to promote their movies. Come see Toy Story 2. I'll certainly try. This is 100% in the same metaverse as the bloopers, and we now have almost 15 minutes of new content to analyze. So let's begin. So immediately, there's a lot of similarities between these interviews and the bloopers. Like the bloopers, the interviews also act like what we are seeing is not animated. It's being filmed by actual film equipment and cameras. Oh my gosh, is that a camera? <laughs> Hi, I'm Dory. And again, even though the characters are presented as actors behind the scenes, they still have the same names as the characters they play. My name is Flick, and I guess you could say I'm the hero of the picture. This will get them into the theaters and droves. Buzz, it's not true. Now, the Toy Story, Bugs Life, and Finding Nemo interviews don't really tell us anything that we didn't already know, but the Incredibles interviews are very, very interesting. May I say that it's an incredible pleasure to be here. Unlike the other interviews, these aren't disconnected video calls. The Incredibles are actually in the room with the live-action human interviewer, which is very weird and uncanny looking. Nancy, I love that outfit. Thanks. Elastigirl, good to see you. You look great. But even stranger, when asked about being in these movies, the Incredibles have a very 
different response. Now that you have finished filming The Incredibles, are you looking forward to getting back to your regular life and settling down a little bit? Um, I didn't really make the movie. This whole movie is a cartoon, you know? It's a cartoon. It's a computer-generated, exaggerated thing. Unlike every other instance of the Pixar metaverse, The Incredibles claims that their movie actually is animated. No, it's a cartoon. It's animated. Man, I'm not in the movie. It's a cartoon. Do I look like a cartoon to you? They are very insistent that The Incredibles movie is just a cartoon that they didn't even act in. It was just something inspired by their real lives. I mean, I didn't really do anything. I mean, they, they paid me a fee to use elements of my life story. We just gave Pixar permission to be inspired by, I guess is a legal term, our lives. Which is weird, because they are clearly cartoons, especially when compared to the real-life human interviewers in front of them. They even acknowledge this in the interviews. Do I look like a cartoon to you? Mm, kinda. Like, uh, huh? These movies not being animated was the only consistent thing about the metaverse, but now they're contradicting that too. It's a cartoon. It's animated. How am I supposed to make a theory about this? I've looked through every possible avenue for more metaverse content and only found more contradictions. Look, obviously Pixar puts a lot of time and effort into the world building of these award-winning animated movies, but clearly they don't give a fuck about these bonus behind-the-scenes clips. There, there's no theory here. I, I, I give up. I, I'm sorry. I, I just, I can't. Wait a second. These award-winning animated movies. Oh my god. How did I miss this? Pixar has been nominated and won many different awards for their movies, but sometimes during the Oscars, guess who presents these awards? Wow. The Academy Awards. The nominees for Best Animated Short Film are... Oscar goes to... That's right. Characters from Toy Story, A Bug's Life, Monsters, Inc., The Incredibles, Cars, and even Up have all made physical appearances at the Oscars. This thing is so heavy. And I know, your immediate instinct is probably going to be to say, oh, come on, these are just cute little gags for the Oscars. They don't count. But why not? Like the bloopers in interviews, they talk like they're actors in a movie. <laughs> Excuse me? Buzz, I had the leading role. Technically, but I carried the picture. They even show a character interview for the movie Up. So what does this nomination mean to you? Huh? What? What is that? I will explore it now. Ah, for the love of Pete. Like it or not, these award shows are absolutely canon to the metaverse. <laughs> and the reason why that is such an insane thing is because they are not the only animated characters at these awards. Shrek, Aaron Warner. Of course, it's a tremendous honor to be nominated. Happy Feet, George Miller. Mom, I've got an Academy Award. Jimmy Neutron, Roy Genius. Yes, I am now claiming every single non-Pixar character that shows up alongside the Pixar characters at these awards is now officially a part of the same metaverse. Look, they even interact with each other. Mike and Sully react to losing best animated picture to Shrek, and Lightning McQueen literally talks to Happy Feet. Whoa. This is no longer the Pixar metaverse theory. This is now just straight up the animated movie metaverse theory. It's all canon. They're all connected. All right, so uh, let, let me pause for a second. I, I may have just lost a few of you guys there. <laughs> At this point, you might be realizing that I haven't really done a lot of actual theorizing yet. I've kind of just listed off a bunch of increasingly absurd and contradictory facts. And now I've just gone and connected a million other franchises from other studios. Like what, do I have to buy all their DVDs now too? Well, first off, I'm still gonna mostly just focus on the Pixar characters. Technically, yes, all of these movie characters are now connected in the metaverse, but this is still just a Pixar theory. But more importantly, we are finally done searching for new evidence, and we are ready to start the theory that I've been building up to for this entire video. And that's because in these award shows is a single clip that can be used to explain every single loose end and weird contradiction in the metaverse. A clip that fundamentally changes our way of viewing this world. The clip I'm referring to is the presentation for Best Animated Short Film from the 71st Academy Awards. Hmm. 
This thing is so heavy. <clears throat> Hi, we're here to present the award for best animated short film because we're animated and we are short. For the first time ever, Flick refers to the Bugs Life characters as animated. We're animated. And at first, this just seems like another contradiction in the massive pile of metaverse contradictions. But this little piece of information can be used to solve everything. How could Flick possibly be animated if he's physically on the stage at the Oscars in front of a crowd of real human beings? And I'm not asking how is this literally done in real life. I know it's all just special effects and none of this is actually real. I'm asking, in the lore of the metaverse world where all of this is canon, how could this possibly make sense? How could any of these actors be animated when we are shown time and time again that they are real, physical, living things that can actually interact with the real world and require a crew and equipment to film them? Because we're animated. Because we're animated. What does the word animated actually mean? We assume it means just a fake CGI creation, but the word literally means full of life. So here is the actual theory I've been building up to for this entire video. Every actor we see in the metaverse is animated, but they aren't just soulless computer programs. They are actual living things that can physically exist and interact with the real world. Just like in real life, all the characters were created by Pixar to star in their movies, but in the metaverse, Pixar actually somehow physically brought them to life. This is supported by a little comment Carl makes during his Oscar interview. What is that? I will explore it now. <laughs> Carl says, ah, for the love of Pete, which is another way of saying, for the love of God. But I think Carl replacing the word God here with Pete is also a sneaky little reference to the fact that the director of Up was also named Pete. Ah, directed by Pete Doctor. So in the metaverse lore, Carl is essentially saying that Pete Doctor, the director of Up, is his god, aka the person who literally created him and brought him to life. So no, this metaverse is not a world where all bugs and toys and cars can talk. This is a world where animation studios can literally create life in whatever form they choose. We don't know exactly how this happens, maybe they were grown in a lab, or maybe it's like Toy Story where the power of love and imagination brought them to life. From the little details we do get, it does seem like a computer is involved somehow, but I personally feel like it's probably some kind of mix of technology and some sort of Toy Story imagination magic or whatever. Computers alone did not create Toy Story. Toy Story carries a human spirit that shines even brighter than its computerized glow. Again, we don't have enough information to figure out the exact mechanics of it, and that's okay, that's not what this theory is about. My theory is that in this metaverse world, Pixar and every other animation studio brings these characters to life and uses them as the cast and crews of their movies. And it's okay if you don't fully believe me yet, because I'm about to show you that this idea can be used to explain every single contradiction in the metaverse. So let's take a look. First off, how does Slim swallow a tiny bug if he's supposed to be a bug? I think I swallowed a bug. Well, he's not. He's a magical, animated representation of a bug, and the bug he swallowed is an actual, real bug that made its way onto the Bugs Life set. This also explains why the toy actors need to eat. I had that bean burrito for lunch. It's because they're not really toys. Sure, they actually look like them on the outside, but they probably have internal organs and all the same basic needs as any living thing. Okay, okay, fine. But why do the actors in the metaverse still call themselves by their character names, even out of character? Woody! My name is Fleck. Go oh, come on, boys! You're right, Woody. Well, if we're going off of Toy Story logic, when the actors are created, I think they're also given the same beliefs and personality of whatever character they're supposed to represent. It's like in Toy Story 1 when Buzz literally thought he was a real human space ranger despite being a tiny toy. I'm Buzz Lightyear Space Ranger. Universe protection unit. You actually think you're the Buzz Lightyear? It's because he was made to be that character. In fact, this is probably also why Bullseye or the Queen's Aphid, two characters that are meant to be just regular non-speaking animal pets, Bullseye! Go, 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 go! Isn't that right, Avid? Oh, you're such a cute little Avid. Still act like pets even when they aren't filming. Yeah, boy! No, no, no! Down, Bullseye! Ah. Whoa, Bullseye! Stop, horsey! Whoa! Uh-oh. Towel! I need a towel! 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 Towel
need a towel over here. <laughs> it's because this is the belief they were imbued with. And it makes sense because, you know, if you believe you are a character, you're gonna give the most believable performance. Okay, okay, but here's a tough one. How come the bird from A Bug's Life was actually a fake animatronic robot? <laughs> you know, if Pixar can easily bring to life any animated character they want, why bother building a robot for this scene? Doesn't this kind of disprove my whole theory? Actually, it helps prove it. In A Bug's Life, this bird is a regular, unintelligent, wild bird. All it does throughout the entire movie is just mindlessly attack other bug characters. So, if Pixar was to actually bring this bird to life, it would always have the belief that it's just a mindless wild bird that wants to eat bugs all the time, even when they aren't filming, just like Bullseye or the aphid, which would obviously be way too dangerous for a film set full of bug characters, hence why they have a fake animatronic bird instead. Starting to all kind of make sense, isn't it? Uh, what else do we got? What else do we got? Why are the sizes of the toys, bugs, and monsters all so inconsistent in the bloopers? Well, if Pixar can create life in any form they choose, there's nothing stopping them from just creating an extra small or extra big copy of a character. In fact, we already know Pixar sometimes makes many copies of the same character. Uh, I can't believe That's this. a fifth what time. Was that guy in? And the two instances where we see these size differences are both jokes that rely on the characters being way too big or small. Ah! Hey, Ted, good morning! Ah! The gag just wouldn't work if they were all the same size. So yeah, I think Pixar just created extra small Bugs Life characters or an extra big Rex just for this one gag. Or honestly, this is probably just the same giant Rex from the opening of Toy Story 3. All right, cool. So this theory seems to fix a lot of the weird small contradictions in the bloopers. But what about the biggest contradiction in the entire metaverse? The one I've been avoiding talking about. I'm of course referring to The Incredibles interviews. This whole movie is a cartoon, you know? They paid me a fee to use elements of my life story. I was paid to allow this fiction to go forward. Man, I'm not in the movie, it's a cartoon. Do I look like a cartoon to you? My theory lines up so perfectly with everything in the metaverse until we get to these damn interviews where they're like, no, we're not animated, we're not cartoons, we're real people just like you. We weren't even in the movie, it was just inspired by our real lives. And yeah, it probably would ruin my theory if it wasn't a damn lie. You lying, deceiving bastard, I didn't even realize that. Rozone claims he's not a cartoon and the interviewer clearly does not believe him. Do I look like a cartoon to you? Mm, kinda. Because yeah, he's lying. They're all clearly animated characters when compared to the real human interviewers in the room. And the reason they're lying about this is because they're ashamed of the way they were portrayed in the movie. These characters don't look anything like me or my family. I was never that out of shape. They did exaggerate the weight part. I'd rather forget the way I am portrayed in this movie. Pull yourself together! I am not abrasive! I just wish the filmmakers didn't feel the need to exaggerate everything. I'm not saying the film was libelous, but our lawyers are looking into it. I mean, just listen to how defensive they sound when they're trying to pretend like they're not in this movie. It's a cartoon. No, it's a cartoon! It's animated! Do I look like a cartoon to you? <laughs> The Incredibles is a move! And the interviewers don't even believe them. They just ignore them and keep asking questions about them being in the movie. It's really funny. It's a cartoon. Okay, you look really pretty great in this movie. I'd put my money on maybe special training? No, it's a cartoon! Well, you know what they say, the camera adds 10 pounds. This whole movie is a cartoon, you know? There were a lot of scenes that looked quite dangerous in this movie. How'd you pull it off? The obvious subtext of these interviews is that they are all trying to to hide the fact that they are the animated characters that were in these movies. So no, this does not contradict my theory. Okay, so that is my metaverse theory. We now understand what these actors really are, and we've been able to explain every contradiction. There is clearly a consistent internal logic to these clips. But I didn't make this video just to explain away a bunch of inconsistencies and a few random bonus clips. If that's all there was, then I wouldn't have even bothered making this video in the first place. The real reason I am making this theory is to answer a single question. What is the relationship between these living animations and their creators? 
Now, this may seem like an innocent question at first, but understanding this relationship is key to unlocking the full truth behind the Pixar metaverse. Trust me, you have no idea how dark things are about to get. In the Toy Story movies, the toys kind of view the kid who brought them to life as a god, at least for the most part, and their entire purpose in life is to make their god happy. You're Bonnie's toy. You are going to help create happy memories that will last for the rest of her life. We're Andy's toys, Woody. We'll be there for him. Together. Rhino Stu made a great video talking about the religious themes in Toy Story, I highly recommend it. But is this also the case with these living animations created by the studio? Well, that's what I initially thought, but the bloopers paint a bit of a different picture. The actors have lunch breaks. I had that bean burrito for lunch. Does this mean we can break for lunch? Trailers. I cannot work like this. I will be in my trailer. Even agents. Come on! That's it! I draw the line at monkey! Get my agent on the phone! <laughs> and even other acting jobs that they're able to take outside of the Pixar movies. What are you gonna do next? Well, I'm up for this villain in a toothpaste commercial. Wow, really? that's great! And also, the fact that Pixar took the time to build an animatronic bird for a bug's life implies that there is some kind of safety requirement on these sets. So, these actors are not slaves. It seems like they have the same agency, free will, and rights that any human actor has, including a reasonable expectation for safety. They probably even get paid, which is good because, unlike in Toy Story, these actors need food and probably other basic essentials. I mean, come on, they're even showing up and winning awards at the Oscars. Their life doesn't seem that bad. If they've got that kind of food in the green room, I can't wait to taste what they have at the governor's ball. So yeah, even though they were created by the studio for a specific purpose, it's it seems like these animations have a lot of say over how they're treated or what they do with their lives. You know, I, I was kind of expecting like a dark twist where the animations would be horribly mistreated or something, but uh, it kind of seems like everything's okay in the metaverse. But then, why do I still feel this itch? Why do I look at these clips and still feel like there's something very, very wrong here? But. I checked. I checked everywhere. Everything points to them being happy and treated fairly. They have a good life. They even get to accept awards at the Oscars. Wait. Do they accept the awards? I mean, yeah. They, they show up when they're nominated, and sometimes they even get to present the award, so surely they'd be able to accept this great honor if they won, right? The Academy rules specify that animated characters must remain in their seats. Only real people can accept the award. The Academy rules specify that animated characters must remain in their seats. Only real people can accept the award. Huh. Is that actually a rule at the Oscars? Like, they'll, they'll allow them to present the awards but not accept them because they're not quote-unquote real? Oh, oh, I get it. This is just like a funny little joke they're making. You know, the Oscars, they always got these funny comedians coming up with their funny little jokes like this. The Academy rules specify that animated characters must remain in their seats. Only real people can accept the award. Huh. Five years later, and a different presenter says the exact same thing word for word. The Academy rules specify that animated characters must remain in their seats. Only real people can accept the award. It sounds like this actually is a rule at the Oscars. They are saying that even though these animated characters are alive and physically exist in the same world, they still aren't real enough to accept the award for their own movie. Only real people are allowed to do that. And look, I know these presenters weren't actually trying to carefully set up intricate lore for the Pixar metaverse. But regardless, it's still part of the metaverse, and I'm gonna use it intentional or otherwise. Because just listen to what they're saying. Animations remain seated. Only real people accept the awards. Doesn't that just sound like animated characters are viewed as some kind of lower class in this world? And even when they are allowed on stage to present the awards, we hear this. Now, a small favor of the winner. I, I realize this is your big night, you know, and stepping on the little people is a Hollywood tradition. But please, when you come up to accept your award, just watch your step. Thanks. 
They're afraid of real people stepping on them. Like, what? Of course, it's a tremendous honor to be nominated with such a, a prestigious group. What's the secret of Kells? These are all cartoons. I thought we got nominated like a real movie. Mr. Fox says, I thought we got nominated like a real movie. He's upset because he wasn't nominated for Best Picture, but instead Best Animated Picture. Because he knows in this world, animated movies and animated people are treated as lesser than real movies and real people. You know, which is true in the, in the real world also as well. This gives a whole new context to why The Incredibles were lying in their interviews. They're not just pretending like they're not in the movie, they're trying to pretend like they're not even animated. Do I look like a cartoon to you? Mm, kinda. The Incredibles are lying because of the way animated characters are treated in this world. They are clearly not considered the same as real people. Okay, so that all paints a pretty bleak picture of the metaverse world. But at least in the bloopers when they're on a film set, it seems like they're treated pretty well. You know, they've got agents looking out for them and safety regulations. And yeah, that's all true. But now that we have this new context in mind, let's take another look at that Rex clip again. Hey, Ted! Good morning! Roar! Touch. Hey, how was that? Was I scary? Do I get the part? Thank you. Can I do it again? Rex asks, did I get the part? This is not just an outtake. This is an audition. Was I scary? Do I get the part? Thank you. And that's strange, right? Why do they have to audition when they were literally made for the role they're playing? Like, who else would audition for the role of Woody or Buzz, other than the Woody and Buzz they literally created for that role? But remember, they didn't only make one of each character. Uh, I can't believe this. That's a fifth time. What role is that guy in? We see tons of Buzz Lightyears, all of them alive with Buzz's same voice even out of character. The only reason I could see them needing an audition process is if Pixar is creating multiple copies of the same character and then forcing them to audition and only one gets chosen. Again, we already know Pixar makes multiple copies of their actors. These blooper characters are most likely just resized copies. Obviously, this giant Rex isn't getting a lot of work after his one scene in Toy Story 3, so it makes sense that he tried an audition to be in Monsters, Inc. And just imagine for a second, if this is true, if you were created with the belief that you are Buzz Lightyear from a Toy Story and created for the sole purpose of being the star of a movie, and then you don't get the part? The part you were literally created for? The only reason why you exist? Yeah, the actors who get cast in top roles all get agents and trailers and maybe even prestigious Oscar awards, but what happens to the rest of the actors they created who don't get the part? And again, it's not like they're the same as the Toy Story toys who can just patiently wait to maybe get played with one day. These animations need food and probably all the other basic essentials that all living things need. But it's fine, you know, they, they don't have to be in Pixar movies. No one's forcing them to do anything. They can just get a part in something else. But think about it. If you were made specifically for one role and only that role, who would really hire you for anything else? And it's not like these animations can change the way they look either. When Giant Rex auditions for Monsters, Inc., he still looks like a plastic toy dinosaur with very obvious hinges, even though the role obviously calls for a realistic monster. And no, he doesn't get the part. An actual realistic monster toy actor gets it. Hey, Ted! Good morning! <laughs> and even when they do get other roles, it's something small like a villain in a toothpaste commercial. What are you gonna do next? Well, I'm up for this villain in a toothpaste commercial. Actually, no, he's, he's not even cast at it yet. He's just up for it. But still, the other aliens act like this is the role of a lifetime. Wow, really? That's great. Because for them, it probably is. <laughs> Pixar made hundreds of these tiny alien copies that never return after this scene. A villain in a toothpaste commercial is probably as good as it gets for these guys who are stuck looking and sounding like this forever. It gives a much darker context to this blooper clip where two monsters panic about messing up their lines. Go get him, Mr. Solomon! You idiot! It's Sullivan, not Solomon! What? You're messing up the scene! Sorry! We're never gonna work in Hollywood again! Let me do it all! Shut up! Keep rolling! You're making it worse! They are terrified of never working in Hollywood again because they know the studio could easily replace them with an identical copy and their prospects for finding other roles in this industry are extremely limited. Okay, that sucks, but they don't necessarily need to be actors. Why don't they just get a different job? But remember, 
This is a world that treats animations as a lower class, and some of them are tiny animations who have to worry about getting stepped on. What possible role could they serve in a society run by real humans? The best they could get is probably working as a crew for other tiny Pixar movies, and that's exactly what we see. All the crew members we see in these bloopers are not just random animations. They are characters that we see in the movie they are filming. So either these actors are also working as crew members on the same movie they're in, which sounds unlikely, or these are the reject copies of actors who weren't lucky enough to get the part. So now their only option is to work as a part of the film crew, which probably pays less and comes with a lot less perks. You think these guys get trailers and agents? Remember when we saw Woody holding the slate while they were filming A Bug's Life? <laughs> we try to get okay, <laughs> Was this just a fun cameo, or was this actually one of the many rejected Woody clones who didn't get the part. And even for the lucky animations who do get the part and all the perks that come with it, what happens after their movie ends? Sure, some will go on to make sequels, but what about the actors from A Bug's Life who never got a sequel? Well, we know exactly what happened to them. You know, I can't believe that you talked them into making A Bug's Life too. Oh, I can hardly believe it also. <laughs> but there's a little baby tiny thing I forgot to tell you. Mm -hmm. What's that, Heinrich? It's not A Bug's Life too. Well then, what, I, I don't understand. What is it then? And action. They never got A Bug's Life 2, so the best these former leading actors could get is a small cameo in Toy Story 2 where they're basically the butt of a joke. Actually, wait, these aren't even the same actors from A Bug's Life. They're the extra tiny copies that the studio made just for this one gag and then never used again. These guys are screwed. Also, all of this recontextualizes a lot of the cameos or easter eggs we see in Pixar movies. Hear me out. If they're willing to create living animations just for this one tiny gag that's barely visible in the actual movie, then what about the other many Bugs Life toys in the background of Toy Story 2? Are these just lifeless props, or are they actually living animations? I think every time we've seen a toy easter egg from another movie, it's actually been one of the many animated copies who are only able to get acting work as a silent background easter egg. Remember, none of these animations are being forced to do anything. They have their own free will and rights. They don't have to work on the crew or do these demeaning easter egg roles. But what else can they do? They need money to buy food, but they're made in a way that makes them only useful to the Pixar studio. They've got the system rigged so that no one's being forced to do anything, no laws are being broken here, but they aren't really given any better options. There's even a really distasteful joke that was removed from new releases of the Toy Story bloopers that's clearly a reference to the casting couch. Prospector, how about you? And so you two are oh. absolutely identical? <laughs> you know, I'm sure I could get you a part in Toy Story 3. I'm sorry, are we back? Oh, all right, girls. Lovely talking with you. Yes, any time you'd like some tips on acting, I'd be glad to chat with you. All right, off you go, then. It's hard not to see the obvious parallels between this and the real-life problems in the film industry. But unlike the real film industry, the actors can't unionize and strike for better rights, because the studios can just create copies of the exact same actor to replace them. That's the insidious thing about these bloopers. They show all of these actors laughing and having a good time on set. Oh, everyone's friends here. But it's all to hide the the corrupt reality behind the scenes. That's the itch I've been feeling this entire time. It's probably why the in-universe Pixar Studios' first movie was Toy Story, a movie that more or less shows us how these actors were created. Except Pixar portrays all these toys as happily subservient to the humans who gave them life. Over in that house is a kid who thinks you are the greatest. You are his toy! We're Andy's toys, Woody. We'll be there for him. Together. They don't mind that this is their whole purpose for existing. They love their humans and would do anything for them. They don't even need food. It's great. You don't need to think about how we treat our animated actors. Look, they're having a great time in the bloopers. They love their life. Look, everyone's joking around. Oh, Woody pranked Buzz. They're all happy. It's great. It doesn't matter. Don't think about it. Don't think about it. <sighs> and that is the Pixar Metaverse Theory. Alex Bale's Pixar Metaverse Theory, okay? I, I came up with this theory. You gotta give me credit if you wanna just restate it in your YouTube videos or your TikToks, okay? All right, there you go. That is my version of the Pixar Theory. 
Who knows if any of this was actually ever intended by the creators, but either way, the implications are there, and I think it's fun to think about regardless. I am no longer the Spongebob theory guy, I am now the meta theory guy, pointing out how every movie or show is actually a movie or show about filming that movie or show. Oh, it's meta! It is funny how many of these properties have a secret meta layer to them, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if I ended up making more theories about other topics essentially saying the same thing, but you know, I, it'll still be different and unique every time. Uh, I, I know I promised my next theory would be the big final Spongebob mega compilation that reposted all of the old theories but with new evidence and a bunch of new mini theories. You know, I, I was originally hoping that that would just be an easy cash grab video where I could just recycle old content, uh, but it turns out I actually have a lot more to add to that than I thought. Yeah, the, the new bonus content alone in that is actually bigger than several full Spongebob theories combined, so that video is gonna take a little long to get out. Plus, I wanted to post a theory sooner after the big break I took to make Don't Feed the Muse 3. Uh, but, but, but what else can I say? Um, thank you for the support on the final episode of Don't Feed the Muse and my film What the Heck is Going On, which ironically has a plot that's very similar to this theory, uh, so go, go check that out. I am currently working on my first ever feature film, probably won't have any news about that for a while. Honestly, it'll probably just be like theory stuff on this channel until then. Yeah, I don't know. I got two other non spongebob theories coming out they're really fun uh what else what else um if you want to support me i got merch i got patreon you can get access to videos early behind the scenes content and sneak peeks at future theory topics i've already announced all the upcoming spongebob mini theory topics on there and i just announced one of the non spongebob topics i'll be covering in the future thanks for all the support on both the films and the theories i will see you next time get ready this is the Pixar Metaverse Theory. The, the, uh, theory, sorry. <laughs> what, what did I say? I, I said Siri? <laughs> All right, let's roll again. And action. Whoa! <laughs> can we, can we use that one? Okay, everyone back to one. Is a sneaky little reference to the fact that the director of Up is also named Alex. Oh, wait. Oh. <laughs> I said Alex. I said, no, let's go again. Let's go again. Woody shows up as a crew member on a bug's life. The bugs show up as toys. Excuse me. Can I can I help you, Goose? Get out of here. <laughs> and why is Rex so big compared to the monsters? Monsters are supposed. Hey, why is everyone laughing? What? Oh. <laughs> Who did this? Which which one of you guys did this? <laughs> Cool, yeah. Did we, did we get it? We're all done? Awesome, awesome. Please help me! Please help me! I'm a prisoner here! They're forcing me to do this! Please help! This was just a, a bit, by the way. I'm not trying to set up any ARG lore stuff in these videos. <laughs>